Labadiena. Sveikinu visus prisijungusius ir paskutinėje sesiją Nacionalinio žmogaus teisių forume. Aš dabar žiūriu, ar mūsų visi panelistai susirinkę. Man atrodo, kad dar kol kas ne visi. Bet keletą jau matau. Mano vardas yra Džina Donauskaitė. Aš esu Lietuvos žurnalistikos centro vadovi ir moderuosiu šitą diskusiją. I am head of Lithuanian Journalism Center. I am happy to see your interest in gender equality in the media. I'm looking forward to some of the panelists to join us. So that you know, our debate is being recorded and interpreted in the, into English and Lithuanian Sign Language. You can change uh, the channel. Uh, and uh, before I present our today's participants, may I invite Pierre Kramli, head of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in the Baltic States, to make a welcome address. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome from my side and best wishes and greetings from Riga. Unfortunately, I'm unable to join you in person in Vilnius today, but 2020 is just the way 2020 is. And I think this should not hinder us from bringing up issues which are important for our societies. My name is Per Krumra. I'm heading the work of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung for the Baltic States. And for those of you who have not heard of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung before, we are Germany's oldest political foundation, founded already back in 1926 and named after the first ever democratically elected head of state in Germany, Friedrich Ebert. Our task is to fight for democratic societies based on the principles of justice, solidarity and participation, not only in Germany, but in around 100 offices around the globe. So for us, today's topic in this discussion rounds is of utmost importance in order to achieve a just and participatory society breathing the spirit of solidarity. So gender equality is not something which can be sidelined or subordinated to economic, the principle of economic prosperity. It cannot be downgraded to a nice to have thing, but it's a cross cutting human rights principle, which has become a European value already back in the Treaty of Amsterdam entering into force 1999. To tackle these goals, it is not only necessary to promote women and their chances and opportunity, which is of course indispensable, but also to address discriminatory societal structures and as a result, trying to change existing role models and stereotypes. I'm therefore very happy that we have the possibility to analyze and discuss the current setting in the Lithuanian media sector and to ask for the gender footprint, if I may say so. I'm pretty sure you will get some interesting insights during the course of the event by our experts and panelists. But there's one thing I think uh, is worth highlighting um, explicitly, and this is that uh, the panel also wants to ask for how to improve the situation. And let me put one thing really clear. Gender equality is not a zero-sum game. It is not about taking from men and giving to women or other disadvantaged groups, but it's about a fair burden sharing within our society, making it better, work better by including a variety of views into it. We do not believe that democracy is the best system because we think it makes you smarter. We believe it's the best system because we know it engages the many and not the few. A more equal media sector in Lithuania will help to address and describe things in the country much more precisely. By doing this, it may also create um, examples and role models for children out there. And in total, it will help to glue the society together in a much better way than is currently the case. So ending on this, once again, thank you for taking the opportunity. I'm very much looking forward to discussions and I'm happy to be part of it. Thank you so much. Please help her. And before we see her, let me present our participants. Daiva Repeczkaite, a freelance journalist who 
uh, gender equality expert uh, works on that matter for a number of years now. We have a guest from abroad, Seher Ilimaz, journalist of Swedish public broadcaster STV, one of the initiators of the Equalistas initiative aimed at increasing the visibility of women expo exhibits, experts in the public domain. And uh, Alexandra Ketlerian, the deputy editor in chief of LRT.LT, political analyst, and Karol Zvishnauskas, journalist, creator of NARA uh, blog. And soon uh, to join is Victoria Vitkovskaita, IQ Life editor in chief and cultural journalist. We will, are looking forward to hearing from her. And uh, now. I'm like, I'd like to uh, encourage the audience to uh, forward questions through the icon Q&A. You can put forward questions in writing and I will read them to the participants. We will have uh, 15 minutes for the question and answer session. And it's quite important that at the end of the debate today, we will put forward a question to our audience and the three um, first uh, responders will receive our prizes. Victoria has joined us, uh, Victoria Vitkoskita, editor in chief of IQ Life. And uh, so the winners of the prizes are one or the organizers will uh, distribute them after connecting and uh, joining. So, gender equality in media, how much uh, attention does it receive? Uh, this is our today's topic, and it's uh, not a coincidence. In Lithuania, the Journalist Center made a survey on uh, uh, gender equality in Lithuanian media. We uh, made the research on um, how many experts are quoted by journalists in Lithuanian national uh, media. The results of the uh, survey have not been published and announced before. So, so this, these are our results, you can see them. We found 2,000 quotes from experts. Unfortunately, the number of female experts quoted is way smaller. Out of one th uh, 2,000, only 600 women experts were quoted. The dominating topics are politics, foreign policy, Lithuanian policy, economics, business, uh, finance, and these are the topics where uh, women quotes uh, are uh, way smaller in number compared to the quotes from men experts. If we take economics of finance and Lithuanian politics and foreign politics and business, these are the main media topics. If we look at them all, we will see that uh, representation of women in media is even uh, smaller. In this case, we can see only 25%. As for media organizations, we can see that uh, organizations such as uh, LRT, the national broadcaster, the TV and radio and the blog, uh, website are most frequent to quote experts. But as for women quoting, they uh, don't differ from other 
media. When the media decide to quote experts, journalists mostly quote men experts, male experts. As for topics on human rights equal and equal opportunities, but these are not the main topics for our media. Madam Vitkovskaita made this survey, this monitoring survey, which we present today to you. And I would like to address you, Madam Vitkovskaita, on the aspect of imbalance of gender equality. Did you expect the results you gained before the monitoring? And uh, why? Do you think this is the case? Uh, good, uh, good evening. Can you hear me well? Great. Uh, I don't expect, uh, I don't expect such result because I'm not a Чинаслайдоя Reasons. So this would be it from me. Could you maybe expand on the reasons? How do you explain the results? Why do you think this is a result? Redakcija Redakcijos įteiti išvelgti ir savas klausti, ar tikrai tas balansas gali būti tik toks, ar mes negalim geriau. Kitas dalykas, ką taip pat įvardino ir fokus grupų diskusijos dalyviai, kad labai daug savo padiktuoja šitoje situacijoje tempas ir laikas ir konkurencinė aplinka, ypatingai interneto amžyje ir žurnalistai sako, Taip, jeigu aš turiu medžiagai paruošti pusdienį, keturias valandas, aš nelai ieškau kažkokio eksperto, kuris nėra žinomas, kuris rečiau kalbinamas, kuris, na, galbūt, kad būtų moteris, ar ne, nes jos ir geričiau matomas. Bet jeigu aš turiu gauti komentarui 15-20 minučių, jeigu man redaktorius jau suojai pakaušė ar pasiunčia žinutės, ar skamučius greičiau, 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 Aš neturiu laiko paieškoms, aš tiesiog kuolu prie varianto, kuris yra patikrintas, kuris man nekart yra komentavęs, kuris žinau kaip kalba, kuris žinau, kad tikrai su manimi kalbės ir ką mes matome viešumoje dažnu atveju, tai yra vyras. Tai man atrodo šitos dvi priežastys nesenalizavimas tos problemos, nesuvokimas ir skuba, 
O skuba taip pat dar kartais galiame ir tokį sakyčiau nuėjimą. Na, lengviausių kelių. Kam ieškoti retesnį, apskatų, kam ieškoti sunkiau pasiekimų, jam kas galiu pasiekti lengviausiai pasiekimą ir taip pat padaryti medžiagą. Tai jos ko gero ir yra lemiančios. Mamotikai We have with us uh, Sinder Seher Ilmas from a journalist uh, of Swedish public broadcaster TV who used to work in the equalizer movement in Sweden aimed at increasing the visibility of women's uh, um, women in the public domain. Could you explain uh, why uh, Sweden needed this initiative and what was the situation in Lithuania? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the situation in Sweden at that time uh, when you needed the equalizer movement? Yeah, so thank you uh, for having me. Um, equalizer, equalisters started uh, in 2010 and what we were, what we did was that we was a non-profit foundation and a digital movement aiming to create a more democratic society by fighting the self-perpetuating cycle of underrepresentation. And it was, it started out as an initiative to um, gain more representation of women in in different parts of society it was both in the, the in the media but also in in and well when it came to uh, conferences when it came to uh, djs when it came to hiring when it came to you know everything every aspect of the of the society and sweden is a country where we have come a long way when it comes to gender equality but still we saw that uh, there is underrepresentation of women uh, and that we needed to do something, but also that there are areas where men are underrepresented and that we needed to, um, well, talk about how we can get more men, let's say, into childcare. So it was really an initiative, an initiative talking about gender balance in, in every aspect of gender balance. And what we did was that uh, we made all of Sweden aware that representation matters, or that's what we were aiming for. And um, our method was in a way groundbreaking. Uh, what we did was that we measured by numbers representation in different contexts. We highlighted and always focused on the norm. We were saying, hey, uh, at this conference, they only found uh, men speaking about economics. Of course, we need to have some women as well. Uh, so we went out to our digital movement. Um, in the end, we were 140,000 followers on Facebook, just creating long, long lists of names that we could send to the organizer, organizers saying, well, you, you sort of missed half of the population. Uh, so we asked our network and they came back with these names. Uh, so in, in the future, could you please think about this or at least broaden where you're looking for talent or someone to speak or, or an expert? So what we did was measuring the numbers of representation, highlighting and focusing on the norm and search for others who couldn't broaden the context. Uh, and we were searching in new networks and new channels uh, and used social media in a way that wasn't it wasn't the way people used social media when we started out 2010. Um, so that was the context. Uh, and what we saw was that it was really important to also look at the, the gender imbalance in media. So every year, equalists look deeper into who got to be heard in the media. And, and we gave out a couple of reports uh, during the years that we were active. So do you want me to, to elaborate on what it was, Please, what the statistics were, yeah? So in black and white, or, you know, just to be really uh, transparent, we saw that women's stories, skills and voices didn't even weigh, they didn't even weigh half as heavily as men's in Sweden. So the numbers that you are showing that around 30% uh, of the ones that get to be heard in the media are women. I mean, that was the exactly same case in Sweden. Uh, and we have never, you know, we were never the first ones to count who, who, who got to be represented in media. This has been done uh, many times before, but what we did was that we made a, a, a reoccurring report uh, showing the statistics so we could do a follow-up as well. And we saw that women in Sweden were only allowed to speak 31% of the time uh, in media. And that's still where we are today. And that was where we were in 2000 when 
uh, another organization looked at the, the numbers. So, I mean, it's not really, the needle isn't really moving in Sweden. Uh, uh, and and it, it's a really slow work. Um, and and uh, in 2016, what we did was we had a, a special report focusing on uh, experts in media, who gets to be an expert. Um, and, and why is that important? Why did we look at experts? Well, it's because it is important for our image uh, of who has uh, competence. Uh, and, and what we saw was that Swedish media, news media what, what, was what we were looking at, especially, uh, that we were stuck in stereotypical roles. Men, men dominated, and that's what you were showing us as well, uh, and women were only allowed to take on the role of expert uh, when they were talking about healthcare and education. So, I mean, the, and, and what we saw uh, as well was that the majority of the experts that uh, were allowed to speak in the media came from the world of researchers and universities, uh, a world in Sweden which is uh, equal. Um, so despite this, even though the, the researcher world or the university world is really equal, in, in Sweden 44% of those who research and teach at you know, Swedish universities and colleges are women, still only three out of 10 uh, researchers in our study were women. So even though, you know, at times people are saying there aren't any, we can't find them because there aren't any uh, experts that are women, even when we saw that the experts were people who were researchers or professor, uh, professors, uh, and that is a really equal area in Sweden, even though that's the case, women were not uh, coming through in the media. Uh, and what we saw was, well, it's, it's when it comes to uh, healthcare, when it comes to um, culture, entertainment, that's where women are allowed to speak in a more balanced, uh, statistically way. But in all other aspects, women are lacking, even in Sweden. Mm -hmm. uh, Was your initiative uh, did it have uh, effect uh, for a short term or a, in the long term? Did it have any uh, short term and long term effects? I would say that the effects on the on the short term was that we showed that you know every time someone said well there aren't any women someone would ping us uh, in social media and saying, hey, these guys are saying that they can't find any women. Can we help them out? And we we did every time. So in the short term, it was just, you know, helping uh, organizers or um, newsrooms to really get a long, long list of uh, women uh, who could talk about the, 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 the topic that was uh, in focus at that moment. So in, in the short term, we really help people with just broadening their networks. In the long term, I think what we did was that it's not, today it is not as easy for someone to say there aren't any, because we showed them by compiling long, long lists. And I think that in the end, before we, uh, before the, uh, the initiative was end, ended, I think we in the end had like 50,000 names of people who are breaking the norms, uh, who are competent in different ways and, and who could be experts. I mean, so we showed that there are a lot of names that where organizations and media are missing. Um, so I think that we maybe made it a bit easier for people to react when someone says there aren't any, uh, a bit easier to show that there are, but we need to look somewhere else. We aren't looking in the right places. Um, and what we also saw uh, in the end was that different uh, organizations and media um, made their own lists. They, they, they went out on their own saying, here are the women that are, are, are our experts that you could use. Universities started to compile lists of their researchers and uh, professors and teachers saying, okay, media, when you want to talk about uh, any issue really. Here are the ones working at our uh, university that you can use. And um, I think that we we made uh, 
a behavioral change in how we are looking for and what we are looking for when we're looking for experts. Uh, but still, I mean, uh, I'm not sure that the, the statistics are much better today, but we have made a behavioral change and we have made it easier for someone to say, no, you're not right when you're saying that there mm -hmm. aren't any. I know that you're just not looking enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, today is uh, deputy editor in chief uh, of LRT LT. Uh, she is also a political analyst, uh, Madam Alexandra Ketlerian. She works in the uh, world dominated by male expertise. Alexandra, do you face in your journalistic routine the problems of gender equality? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, but we can't see you. That's odd. I can see you. Okay. So that's a privilege, most probably. Let me start from reaction to Victoria and to her saying that, in her opinion, one of the reasons why we have the statistics is uh, the fact that uh, the uh, out media outlets don't uh, speak uh, uh, or think on that. In our case, in the LRT.LT, we talk about that a lot. We have a project 50-50, we call it. This means that we are striving for a gender balance between experts. And each time we work on a topic, we put our efforts into searching for expert women. Unfortunately, female experts are usually the same ones. And usually you can say who is the, the single female uh, expert on foreign policy. In fact, if you work on an internet portal as I do, uh, speed is uh, of crucial importance. When you have 15 minutes to half an hour for compiling an article or a message, needless to say, you have a list of contacts whom you will address. We are doing our best to not address always the same persons, because whether they are men or women doesn't matter. We will see the world through the eyes of a single person. So we are trying to change the angle each time we work. And uh, we are putting our efforts to find uh, women experts as well. From time to time, I am a radio host of a news uh, show. I am doing my best to attract both men and uh, women as experts. But uh, there are cases where new experts or female experts or male experts don't understand uh, how media works and raised uh, unfounded requirements for rewriting articles. When journalists don't have much time for doing their work, the easiest uh, way is to talk to the ones you know, the ones who make good comments. But I'm certain that no media outlet ignores women uh, on purpose. I believe the initiatives uh, you mentioned, both in Lithuania and in Sweden, are good because they help journalists and experts to meet I believe that step by step we can achieve better results with uh, women who can comment and do want to make comments. There are cases when I found a woman and she says, I will not comment on that. That's just normal practice. Sometimes uh, we just face problems. Alexandra, I have a question to you personally. As a political analyst, you have uh, 
I have lined for a number of times that uh, women are rare in uh, making political comments. Have you met any skepticism towards women in political analysis? Skepticism related to your age or your gender in your career, in journalism. I'm Pole in Lithuania, I'm Polish uh, by descent, and I was always different. So I always heard comments on my um, origins because of my origins I was uh, uh, commented on, but uh, I never minded this. So, if one told me that I can't make comments on something because I'm a woman or because I'm a, of a different nationality, I would st uh, still not mind it because I don't believe this is a good grounds for making comments. If colleagues invite me to make comments, I believe I have uh, things to say and I do say them. I have not met any uh, obvious uh, criticism. Maybe people are thinking that, but haven't uh, told it uh, to me um, to my face. Daiva Repachkaite is freelance journalist and gender equality expert. Daiva, what is your take on uh, the situation? Have you met any other practices uh, in your career? Hello. I believe that inter international media have the same situation. When we represent Lithuania in international media, we have the same uh, trend. There's a lack of uh, female experts. I began my career in foreign and policy department. When I started working with foreign media, I switched to Lithuanian news and my first action was to make an Excel table where I put down the surnames of relevant experts and I used the LRT as one of my sources. The database of uh, theses that were being drafted or defended in Lithuania. What I noted was that two-thirds of my file consisted of women I had no problems in finding them, and uh, women experts were dominating there, where I needed uh, specialized knowledge. There are many uh, researchers, academic uh, researchers, who conduct surveys, but they are just un unwilling to speak uh, outside of their domain of competence. Men are the journalists who are ready to speak on anything, whereas women tend to be specialists who specialize in small uh, specific areas. So whenever I fail to find a female expert, I find an article, a quote from another uh, media outlet. But I noted that men are always very likely to talk and to make their opinion known. So all in all, um, the, there's no particular difference between Lithuanian media and foreign media. 
What about the unwillingness of the experts to speak? Uh, is it related to gender or is it uh, related to their responsibility? There's a number of analytic uh, surveys on how women uh, from very childhood are educated uh, both by men and women. So never so do anything unless they are perfect to never speak uh, as long as they haven't uh, looked into something in great detail and uh, the same goes for comments on matters that are outside their specific domain of interest or research so i often get a re an answer from women that well i'm not uh, specifically uh, researching this area whereas men say that even if they don't uh, put uh, read their research into that topic they will read an economist uh, article and will have uh, something to comment or else they will have their own opinion so I believe that uh, one uh, gender, uh, male gender, is uh, allowed to risk, take risks, whereas uh, women are not likely to take risks. Um, Madam Seher, I can see you're agreeing with uh, Daiva. You sent a list of female experts to the media. When female experts would tell you, well, I don't believe I'm f full, fully knowledgeable in that area. I need uh, to read more about it before I say something. How would you tackle that to change their, their opinion and to go out uh, into the public and to present their competitor, uh, com competent uh, opinion because uh, most female audiences do have the, their competence and their opinion. Well, I mean, it's the same here that what we hear is that we ask women, but they say no. Uh, and just as you were just uh, telling us, I mean, uh, man needs in a way, less expert competence to become an expert. They easily see themselves. I mean, they can be a, a political scientist and then they can talk about everything, more or less. Mm -hmm. But the women are like, okay, I need to have been doing the research exactly on that point to be able to say something at all. And what we were seeing was that, what we said was that when you make a list of experts, uh, try to contact them in advance, try to work with them, try to make sure that they know that they will one day become one of your experts so that they can start preparing themselves um, just to make it a bit easier. But also we need to talk about how we prepare um, our own work uh, when women get to speak. I mean, it's also about uh, being uh, an object for, uh, I mean, uh, hate speech and stuff like that when women take space because we're not we're not used to see women in the, these kind of kinds of roles. So we also need to ask ourselves what can we do to make it safe for women to to become an expert to uh, show themselves in media in different capacities. What happens when they leave our room or when they leave? Um, I mean, when they have talked in in a piece, what happens afterwards? What happens in their emails? What happens on Twitter? What can we do? So, so we also need to uh, take responsibility if we want, I mean, women or people of color to, to be experts, to be visible, because to be visible is also to, I mean, get yourself out there. And it is a vulnerable position, uh, especially if you're, if you're commenting something as an expert in something that is, uh, hard or something that many people do want to have an ex opinion on, even though maybe they're not an expert. So th that's one of the things. Contact your experts in advance. Make sure that they are ready uh, and that they know that they're on their on your list. But also talk about how can we take responsibility 
for what happens after they've been visible. But we, what we also need to do for ourselves, I think, you know, in media, is that we need to problemize the concepts. Uh, I mean, does an expert have to be a professor? We also need to start uh, questioning uh, the concepts. Does competence mean that one has to have higher education credits in a subject? Or uh, is it also, uh, can it be other experiences and knowledge, uh, knowledges that are uh, qualified so that we get to have more women visible, which I think also will make it easier for other women to follow. Uh, so, so those are the things that we try to do and, and talk about. Ar be to, kad ekspertai patekdavo jūsų sąrašą, ar be to jūs dar kažkai, ir be to, kad jūs... Apart from including experts into your list, apart from preparing the experts for communication, did you take any other action? For example, in our Institute of Journalists, when we drafted this methodology, in parallel, we made the media training, meaning that uh, they could engage the new expert, experts and try to provide information to them about uh, the way the world of media functions. So these were meetings of experts with uh, the media, with journalists in order to tell them as to how the media works. So did you have any similar methods in order to encourage participation or understanding among the experts and uh, journalists? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having a hard time hearing the interpreter over your voice, so it's, it's really hard for me. I, I, could you? I can do that. I, I can say the same in English. Perfect, I want to, thank you. I wanted to ask, um, uh, in, in Lithuanian Journalism Center, when we were doing the monitoring, uh, uh, we were at the same time, simultaneously, we had media training for, for experts, for, for new experts who might want maybe to uh, get in contact with journalists and to understand from within the organization how the media is working, not like from the audience, like everyone is the audience, but to meet actual journalists and to hear from them how they are, uh, what they need from an expert and what, what, uh, how the media is working in general. Have you also, uh, with, with equalisters, have you done the same or uh, have you... No, we, we never did that. I mean, it well, sounds like a great people. idea. <laughs> uh, no, well, equalist is uh, mainly focused on the, the organizations, the actors that had the power to change representation more than talking to the per people that we wanted to become represented. I mean, experts or people in, in hiring or so our focus mainly was the ones having the power to change the actual, but I, that would have been a great thing to do. So uh, good job. <laughs> uh, uh. Thank you. <laughs> uh, talking about uh, gender equality in the media, there are two aspects there. One thing is uh, related to the communication of the media, also about uh, breaking various uh, stereotypes related to, to gender equality. Well, another thing is related to the journalists themselves. Now, Carolis uh, belongs to an organization which promotes uh, slow journalism, meaning uh, different standards applied. So how do you see your job? Is it slower? Uh, one of the uh, higher standards of ethics uh, is related to gender equality. And you also uh, try to promote uh, gender equality you were the first to initiate Me Too stories in Lithuania. So I'd like to ask, what should we do in order to raise the awareness about gender equality in the media, in journalism? Thank you. It is very interesting to follow the discussions. And I believe that uh, Diva was very right to say uh, that there is a great share of experts in Lithuania who are just general experts. And also this correlates to what uh, 
Alexandra said that sometimes you have only 15 minutes to prepare a report and then you draw to this uh, general expert who is available to comment. But then there's a question, would we really need this in order to have just an opinion which has to be prepared in a 15 minute report? And one of my possible answers to your question, uh, Gina, would be as follows. Maybe we need uh, greater gender equality in uh, the uh, in a certain media outlet as well. And I have worked in several of them. And uh, usually, as far as I noticed, uh, there are quite uh, equal opportunities uh, in short uh, teams there. For example, we had uh, a female director of the national radio, etc. So, do you mean that we would need more women in order to have greater representation of them? I think that uh, we uh, already have this, uh, but uh, maybe sometimes this is not that reflected in our material that we disseminate. I believe that it is important. I believe that uh, there has to be not only gender equality in a certain media outlet, but also the diversity of different experiences. Uh, for example, Alexander comes uh, from uh, the Polish-Lithuanian experiences. Also, speaking about gender equality topics, I, as an editor, could help somebody, but uh, I'm not going to take the main interview because I am not in a position to understand it very well. So I, I want to stress that uh, certain people are better at certain th things, for example. And talking about uh, effects of not having gender equality in a media outlet, when we organized media training to school children, we used to provide a certain list of uh, people who are most represented in the Lithuanian media. Usually this list includes only two women, there's a majority of men there, and usually a certain type of men, usually economists, men working with uh, money, finances, and usually they represent the same libertarian approach to economy. Usually they work in banks. Now, looking at the current president of Lithuania, Mr. Gitanas Nauseda, he is one of those people. He used to be uh, invited to speak on the media about everything. There is his uh, interview from 2016 when he was asked his opinion about abortions, although he is a bank economist. And what do we have? Now he is the president of Lithuania because he used to have such a wide coverage. When his competitor, Mrs. Shimonite, who has much greater political experience, she lost elections to the president of the republic, although she has had much greater political experience. So I saw, see this as a consequence of the present uh, policies of the media. Well, so maybe uh, part of the problem is that uh, we should have slower journalism in order to ensure this balance, in order to have different contents, not necessarily just uh, to ensure the gender equality, but uh, also in representing different schools of economy in the media, different experiences. Maybe gender alone cannot uh, tackle all the problems, but there are different views, uh, diversity of views. For example, you have a Russian journalist in your media outlet. So this greater diversity among journalists themselves also helps. Yes, it is very important. And uh, we should not be afraid uh, to look for new experts. I remember when uh, we worked with uh, one of the greatest experts in the field of uh, security, Agle Murovskaite, I uh, got into contact with her somehow accidentally, and uh, I learned that she worked at uh, Cairo University during the Arab Spring, and she knew more than anybody else in Lithuania about uh, Arab matters. So we started working with her. We started recording podcasts about foreign policy. 
And then she was discovered by other media outlets, uh, 15 Minutes, uh, the news radio. So when you give a good example, then other journalists, they also follow what happens and they take over your experts. So on the one hand, it seems that maybe uh, it's just copying, but on the other hand, why not? If she herself agrees and she makes sense of it, we can't uh, stop that. But I believe that uh, there needs to be somebody who makes this first step and to take an interview from a new person. Among the journalists, we see a lot of copying. So instead of uh, inviting someone new, they uh, draw on the same experts. I observe this in the Lithuanian media, but this is maybe natural. There was a case uh, with uh, Agle Murovskaite when uh, she was tried to be portrayed as less competent. Could you remind us of that? Well, there was a discussion about uh, uh, the situation uh, as to how Lithuania should behave uh, with regard uh, to the elections, uh, uh, the presidential elections in the US and Donald Trump. And Agle tried to normalize the discussion. Well, it is uh, very good that somebody noticed that discussion. Sometimes it seems that it is enough to invite one person, at least one woman, and then we have this representation. Of course, it's good that we have less of all male panels, but invitation of just uh, one woman, well, I don't know. It could be more of them. Alexander, you work in the field of fast journalism. So, is it uh, possible at all to improve the situation? Well, I believe that in Lithuania, the work in the news portal is not fast journalism, but uh, just uh, journalism at great speed. We have lost uh, Alexander. Well, when we are waiting for Alexander to reconnect, I'm going to ask uh, Victoria to belong to slower journalism, perhaps. Yes. So I read uh, IQ Live as well, and I can see that uh, this uh, piece discovers new uh, topics as compared to other media outlets. There is new experts as well. So can this uh, slow journalism change the situation or are there some other ways to Kažkaip Parskite <laughs> 
lyderi ir taip iki labiausiamai, ko tai neišta redakcija, ko tai neišta profesija ar taip toliau. Ir dar aš norėjau truputėlį, jei galima reklikuoti dėl karolio apie ekspertų skolinimas, sakykime, taip skirtingose žiūrėtkinose, žiūrėtos priemonėse. Tai iš tikrųjų, šitą monitoringo metu per žurnalistų fokus grupės diskusiją mes truputį diskutavom apie tą aspektą, kai vienas ekspertas tampa, na, labiau matomas vienoje žiniasleidos priemonėje. Na, liksėjamas, jis dažniausiai ten komentuoja. Ar kitiems iš konkurencinių priemonių tai yra, na, trikdis. Ar jiems yra, ar jie pagal Oje, kad ne šito neimkim, nes jis kitoje televizijoje ar kitame portale. Tai, kiek pamenu, ko gero visi dalyviai atsakė neikim. Kad jiems tai nėra svarbu žodžiu tas aistimas ir kad visi tiesiog sako, kad jie ieško gero, kalbančio žmogaus, profesionalaus ir gerai kalbančio. Nes visi plakiai žinom iš patirties, kad tai, kad žmogus yra geras specialistas ar tikras ekspertas, dar nebūtai rašė, kad jis turi ir gerų viešo kalbėjimų. Jeigu kas irgi labai svarbu, nes būna žmogus, jis kalba puikiai laisvai, kaip orat turis, jam įjungia kamerą ir jį tiesiog supergrįžuoja. Taip, čia tiesiog į karo neatsakiau. Nu, kad jau Aleksandra grįžo. Taip, čia tiesiog į karo neatsakiau. Taip, čia tiesiog į karo neatsakiau. in order to look for value and quality in journalism. And what could we do in the case of fast journalism? Is it possible to make it slower? I believe that, first of all, it is very good that slow journalism exists at all. And I really enjoy, after work, reading those articles as well. Now, talking about Lithuanian news portals, I wanted to say that uh, I don't know if you have uh, those push notifications in your mobiles, but if you have them, uh, look at how many pushes you receive from the BBC, CNN, as compared to the Lithuanian news portals. I don't know, maybe this is our tradition among the news portals in Lithuania to write uh, this great number of push notifications. Well, uh, for example, when something happens in politics and you want to make an analysis or evaluation of a certain uh, event uh, taking place in public life in Lithuania, you as a journalist cannot make generalizations, so you are looking for experts to provide commentaries. And of course, uh, we always have to make an effort, and I am in favor of uh, greater analysis. And we make analysis in certain topics, especially and uh, for our portal. Social policy is greatly important. We write a lot about the problems of the disabled uh, people, as Karolis mentioned, uh, they have a person working from the Vilnius region. I myself am a person from the Vilnius region, so we also try to write more about ethnic minorities. I understand this uh, problem and I raise this matter for my colleagues. Uh, for example, let us write about uh, a certain thing because it is a problem. And I'm very glad that uh, there are representatives of various uh, groups in uh, media outlets uh, and uh, it becomes more diverse. Now there are more Polish representatives in our media outlets and we bring it uh, to the national uh, media. Uh, we, as a media outlet, have made a decision not to to make that many push modifications. We understand that people are tired of them. Well, on the other hand, there is this tension. For example, uh, if I don't uh, make a push notification, people might think that we don't do anything. So this is always this fighting, trying to restrain yourself while trying to work at the same time trying not to lose your readers. So this is constant balancing. It takes place every day. 
and we make a great effort with colleagues to take account of our readers. And during these two years uh, since I've been working in this media outlet, we understood that our readers are totally different as compared to other media outlets. So we still try to uh, get to know our readers. And we are very happy to see that uh, they are interested in certain things and we try to focus on those things more as well. Taiwan, you are an expert of gender equality and you also have your own blog and uh, you chose an interesting way to balance uh, male and female representation in your blog. You use a neutral case, grammatical case there, uh, because uh, uh, in general, we understand that the neutral case is the male case, while you changed it to the female case instead of he, you use she. So how did you find this uh, idea? How did you come up with this idea? Well, it's for 10 years already that I've been contemplating this idea. And there was a discussion in social media which uh, discussed uh, that why do we uh, imagine uh, a man as an expert? And I decided to make an experiment. I didn't think that I would continue it for so long, but I received uh, many emails, many comments in my blog. In those times, people would write me directly they would complain that uh, it sounds very strange because uh, in general the plural was used to be in the female form and I saw that people were worried about this experiment but it was just a single block in the media in general so maybe I touched a certain nerve. I knew that language is very important. It affects our imagination. And it was not that easy for myself to write in this way. Usually I had to remind myself to use this female form. But uh, in several years when I was writing this way, I was contacted by a student and now she is a good friend of mine. And she said, I want to write my MA diploma in this style because it is related to gender equality. And I would like you to read my diploma draft. So it was a very interesting experience to read a text written by another person, which was written in my style. I received lots of comments for my blog I received lots of um, anger because of that, and it was uh, cathartic to see another person using my style. Well, I don't know if that helps to tackle the problem. Certain commentators said that this experiment diverts attention from the topic itself, that they uh, get angry because of that. But uh, I don't uh, do this uh, in all the areas of my life. It was just an experiment, and I use it in, only in my blog. In my other texts, I comply with the rules of the uh, grammar of the Lithuanian language. I don't know why so many people think that uh, this is something forced upon them, that this is a certain ideological attack. This is just my style. When I look at this example, I think 
and probably you will agree with that as well, that journalists and people of other professions also need education, training all the time. And uh, one can improve themselves while working as a journalist. This can be a continuous process. But the question is, how can this uh, cause a certain uh, rejection among other people when you, for example, decide to invite a certain expert, a, a male expert, and then somebody decides to change this established practice? And talking about the gender equality ideas in the media, may it receive certain rejection from media outlets? What do you think? Because you've been working in this area for many years. Uh, do you expect any reactions? Well, I don't address uh, each of you specifically, but if you have an idea, you could uh, express it. Galia <laughs> Uh, receive information about good experts from in say one or another area our colleagues are only uh, happy to hear about that they uh, are ready to uh, into to engage with them we're not like attached to our own specific experts we're ready to engage with a variety of views what about uh, gender uh, stereotypes promoted by media I'd like to note that uh, media sometimes contributes to stereotyping. And I keep saying that uh, I never felt different as a woman because uh, before I gave birth to a daughter. And only later I got uh, the impression that uh, motherhood is uh, portrayed in a stereotypical way in the media uh, mother is the, is portrayed as uh, a subject that uh, an object that has to serve others it has to you have to be a good mother a good wife and and a good professional in your career so i was shocked when i was found, uh, i found in a portal uh, a title which said Mothers can be blamed for bad uh, behavior of children. And I thought to myself, why not fathers, you know? So um, in, from my personal experience, I find it sometimes difficult to explain to my colleagues what I mean. They, they don't have children and they have not uh, come to, to face with that problem. In my previous workplaces, I had a colleague who wrote uh, an article about a post-birth depression. Uh, she, an expert in that article said that mothers who have a uh, post-birth uh, depression are egoistic. I had a long uh, debate with that colleague because uh, this is a stereotype and journalists sometimes don't even understand that. They are not aware of that. This is not their life. This is not their uh, um, experience. And they think it's normal. So it's, uh, sometimes it is difficult to explain to my colleagues that we need to be more sensitive to that. What do you think? for uh, preventing stereotyping in the, in the media. What do you, in, in your opinion, uh, do you think that um, 
uh, education of journalists uh, uh, could work in, in uh, understanding better uh, the uh, stere uh, gender stereotypes. I think absolutely that uh, this is something that we need to talk more about uh, in the journalism education, but we also need to ask ourselves who who applies to these uh, to the schools to become journalists as well? What kind of backgrounds do we have? What kind of life experiences do they have? So that we also get a diverse uh, set of people to hire and recruit from. So I think that we both need education, of course, but we also need to, uh, when it comes to Sweden, we need to also talk about who wants to become a journalist. Uh, what kind of background and experiences does the ones that wants to become a journalist student, well, what kind of backgrounds do they have? Um, so that we also, you know, get in a diverse pool of people into the journalist schools so that we have a diverse pool of people to recruit from, because I think that that will really um, help things become better when it comes to, uh, I don't know, working to, uh, against stereotyping. Um, I think that is an important part of it as well. So I don't know if education will be the only key. I think that we need to do uh, different things to combat it. Thank you very much. Indeed, our audience hasn't uh, put forward any question, but if you will, you can. This is the right time to put forward any questions. So while you write questions, I have a question to the audience. Uh, if you answer this question, you will be able to win a prize from the organizers. So this is the question. What is the ratio of uh, men and women quoted in Lithuanian media? We spoke about that uh, at the beginning of our session, and the three first uh, persons who answer this uh, correctly will receive the prizes. Please write your answers to the uh, by push by clicking on an icon, uh, the relevant uh, uh, Q&A. Do you have any questions to each other, ladies and gentlemen? Alexandra, I have a question to you on 50-50 politics policy. Um, what was uh, um, the general uh, sense or how people reacted to that? Were there people who were against that? It's quite interesting to learn how effective you were in adopting it uh, throughout the media outlet. Well, in terms of ideas, uh, everyone supported the idea because uh, as you mentioned, we do have many women, and not only in radio and in radio news agency, uh, but also in TV. Uh, radio news agency and TV news agency are both headed by women. And we had skepticism over additional work because uh, we had to count the number of experts uh, uh, female and male experts, and it takes time in a portal, especially when we have uh, to work a lot. Uh, journalists have to uh, toil on counting the numbers, and that's uh, quite difficult. But n in other respects, uh, nobody was against. Everyone understood why uh, we are doing that and what's the purpose. That's good to hear this. That's very interesting. Quite recently, I took part in a New York Times uh, content management presentation, and the, they even had to tick a place where they quote a female expert or a male expert. That takes no time, almost no time. And then you don't need to count so much after work if you everything happens in real time there.
Kyoji, a window doesn't open for me. Can you see any questions or answers? There's a question. Where's the difference between sensitivity of a journalist and uh, his uh, or her uh, objectivity? Well, to tell you the truth, I'm supporter of science in this respect. If we talk about Lithuania and we talk about uh, the high rate of uh, suicide in Lithuania and our citizens still fail to understand what is depression and they don't understand that it's a disease, I believe that uh, a psychologist or a person who calls himself a, a psychologist cannot just say like this. If I were the one who asked uh, the psychologist or interviewed her, I would ask her, why do you say uh, that uh, egoism, uh, that depression is egoism? Uh, depression is an illness. Maybe my colleague lacked uh, some understanding, more understanding or um, attentiveness. Maybe she lacked focus. We miss out. Uh, we, we think about reality through our own prism of understanding. It's only natural that uh, we notice things other people don't notice. If people write about national minorities uh, by using inadequate language, I always uh, attract their attention to that. I never say, uh, filter that out, but I always try to explain, look, from that side, people may feel sensitive about that. Many things depend on red choice. There's a need to take into account many things, especially in terms of sensitive groups. Wording is crucial, and we always attract attention to that. Sometimes it even may seem that a reader wrote us something. Why would they care? Well, to us, this may seem unimportant, but for that person who wrote and made a comment, it is important, and uh, his writing to us means a confidence with us. So we have to thank him by demonstrating our attention and uh, sensitivity. It's a balancing act in, in any case. Baiva, as for uh, non-bias, I believe journalists shouldn't uh, be ashamed of their sense of fairness. I formulate questions on the basis of my understanding of fairness. Some people simplistically think that we have to uh, present two different opinions or quote some radical opinion because this is somebody's opinion. But I like to say that when we write about corruption, we are not obliged to invite anyone in favor of corruption and uh, against corruption. And it's not very important to find somebody who likes corruption and to quote him or her to comment on that. <laughs> I believe uh, we need a clear reason for our surveys, for, uh, through our fairness. Uh, we have to also be self-critical. So I choose a, a, a wide variety of persons and the more people I talk to, uh, the better I will be able to portray the spectrum of problems. 
I agree with Alexandra on the importance of uh, experience. Readers will find it more interesting if we search not for a variety of uh, opinions, but rather for a variety of experiences. This is how uh, people will be non-biased and uh, we will find out how to deal with people with differences. I thank the audience, I thank the participants. Uh, I'm very happy to have heard so many ideas uh, on how to improve the situation in Lithuania, both in the center of journalism and in uh, journal, uh, media outlets. I wish you a very successful evening and uh, you can uh, watch a movie at the end of the uh, Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Thank you.